Our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Peter Madaw, who will be speaking on security on personal property in the 1980s. And Peter was educated at Queen's University, where he received his BA, later at the University of Toronto, where he received his Master's in Arts and History. Later he went to the University of Toronto Law School, and he later from that took his LLM at the Harvard Law School. In 1969, he became a professor of law and uh, later became the assistant dean, in fact, of the Osgoode Hall Law School. Then, in 1975, he left and uh, went from the groves of academe to Bay Street, becoming a partner in the firm of Torrey, Torrey, Delorier, and Binnington, where he presently is and has been since that time. Peter specializes in banking and international finance and uh, we're very fortunate to have him on this topic today. Thank you, Bert. Well, with respect to personal property security in Ontario during the decade of the 1980s, in contrast to the decade past, I foresee a period primarily devoted to the techniques of implementation rather than further legislative development. On the one hand, we have our relatively new Personal Property Security Act and some five years of in judicial interpretation thereof for our guidance. And on the other hand, we have the recent decennial revision of the Bank Act containing amendments to so-called Section 88 security, which uh, may be taken by our chartered banks. Undoubtedly, the decade will also see the long-awaited marriage between the provisions governing corporate securities presently contained in the Corporation Securities Registration Act and the provisions governing personal property security generally now contained in the PPSA. In fact, a sort of common law arrangement has already been instituted by virtue of an amendment to the PPSA which was enacted last June to which I'll refer in a, in a moment. In my view, the 1980s will present us with an opportunity of implementing this new legislation to the best advantage. This is not to say that this will not be a period of innovation. Indeed, the real challenge, in my view, will be to break with old patterns of approach and documentation and to utilize the flexibility and the comprehensiveness of the new legislation in novel and creative ways. In keeping with the general theme of this series of lectures, I will focus upon the new legislation governing personal property security primarily from the point of view of the corporation, both as a borrower and as a lender. I will not take this opportunity to delve into the fascinating history that uh, led to the creation of a dual system of perfection of personal property security in this province, nor will I relate the details of the inherent conflict between those two regimes that came to a head with the turf care decision in 1978. There are, however, two events of significance pointing towards the eventual merger of the two systems which were worthy of comment. In the fall of 1980, the Minister of Consumer and Commercial Relations presented a draft of an act to amend the Personal Property Security Act, which I'll refer to here as the draft bill, which proposed, among other things, the repeal of the CSRA and the inclusion of all corporate securities within the provisions of the PPSA. While the introduction of the draft bill in the legislature was postponed for a variety of reasons, an interim step was taken last June with a passage of a brief amendment which provides that notwithstanding the current prohibition uh, in the PPSA, a mortgage charge or assignment, the registration of which is provided in the CSRA, shall not be invalid by reason only that it has not been registered under that act if the security interest created is perfected by registration in compliance with the PPSA and the PPSA shall be deemed to have always applied to it. Well, ostensibly, the purpose of the amendment was to cure situations such as that found in turf care so as not to render a security interest invalid, null and void, simply because it was a, uh, a debenture that ought to have been registered under the CSRA within the prescribed time. Upon examination, however, it will be observed that the wording of the amendment is broad enough to, to exempt almost any corporate security that is registered under the PPSA um, from the provisions of the CSRA. 
Indeed, the amendment falls short of complete usurpation. Only in the requirement it appears that the security interest be registered under the PPSA. And as you know, certain types of security interests, such as those in securities, uh, letters and advices of credits, instruments, negotiable documents of titles, may only be perfected under the PPSA by way of possession. So to the extent that we have such uh, collateral involved, we may have an instrument that's vulnerable to attack under the argument that it still should have been registered under the CSRA because it's contained in a debenture. Nevertheless, both the draft bill and the June amendment clearly toll the death knell for the CSRA in this province. With that in mind, there are two issues of interest which I'd like to explore. First is the impact of the provisions of the PPSA upon trust companies and others performing the function of a trustee on behalf of lenders under a trust deed or trust indenture, which provides for the securing of bonds, debentures, and other evidences of indebtedness of a corporate borrower. And the second issue is the status of the floating charge given by a corporate debtor under the new PPSA. First then, the trustee, a man who appears to be caught somewhat in the middle. The trustee plays a key role in corporate financings. Under a deed of trust or similar instrument providing for the issue or guarantee of debt obligations, a trustee stands as the representative of the various lenders. Whether they be a diverse group of widely scattered investors, as in the case of a public issue, or whether they be a few financial intermediaries, as in a private placement. The trustee performs a facilitating function whereby he receives periodic information from the debtor, he organizes meetings of security holders, and often disperses payments of principal and interest on, on the underlying uh, <laughs> instrument. In secured transactions, the trustee acts as the secured party to whom the security interest in the debtor's property is granted, thereby enabling the variety of interests represented by the underlying bonds, debentures, what have you, to be treated in the event of any realization upon the security in an equal and rateable manner. The duties and standard of care of a trustee performing this role are codified in the OBCA and in the case of public issues are mandatory, in the case of private placements they are often voluntarily assumed. At present, trust deeds and indentures providing for secured corporate debt obligations and registered under the CSRA and when that uh, statute is repealed, such instruments will constitute security agreements under the PPSA. And here it is urged that the enabling legislation contain appropriate provisions for the trustee in light of the specific function that he performs in these situations. To treat the trustee simply as another secured party on the same footing as a lender who has assumed the credit risk and actually advanced funds to the debtor would be most inappropriate. Both from the point of view of substantive fairness and administrative burden, the position of the trustee requires special recognition. I would assume that no one will quarrel with the proposal of the present requirement under the PPSA to renew the registration of a financing statement with respect to a security interest every three years be eliminated, at least in the case of corporate securities. One approach, that adopted in the Manitoba legislation, is simply to permit a perpetual registration of a financing statement for corporate securities. The problem, however, is the difficulty in defining what constitutes a corporate security. The Manitoba Act adopts wording identical to that it used currently to identify those kinds of securities for purposes of our CSRA in Ontario. Hence, the current debate as to what exactly constitutes a debenture will continue, not to determine which system of perfection governs, but whether to see whether the security agreement qualifies for perpetual registration. A better solution appears to be that contained in the draft bill which would permit a secured party to opt for perpetual registration in connection with any type of secured transaction. An appropriate registration fee structure will discourage the automatic selection of this alternative over the three-year period with respect to simple conditional sales contracts, chattel mortgages, and the like. The present PPSA imposes a certain policing function on the secured party in an effort to keep the register current. A serious concern, which has perhaps been less uh, appreciated than the three-year renewal problem, is the exposure to inordinate liability that would result from the application of such provisions to a trustee. For example, subsection 49.2 of the Act provides that within 15 days of learning of a transfer of collateral by the debtor or a debtor's change of name, 
The secured party must register a financing change statement indicating the transfer in the name of the transferee or the name change in the new name of the debtor, as the case may be, or else the security interest becomes unperfected. However, under subsection 49.3, the secured party may re-perfect his security interest by filing a financing change statement at any time during the unexpired uh, registration period. Upon registering such a financing change statement after the expiration of the 15-day period, the security interest is re-perfected back to the date of its original registration, subject only to the rights of any intervening secured parties who have perfected between the expiry of the 15-day period and the date of refiling. When one looks at the proposals contained in the draft bill on this, however, not only is this uh, policing duty extended to trustees, but the draft bill has changed the consequences of failing to file a financing change statement within the 15-day period and made the consequences for such failure particularly dire. The new act, or at least the new bill, appears to have the effect of making any financing change statement registered outside the 15-day period, effective only from the date of refiling and not the date of the original registration. Accordingly, the secured party who files late will be subordinate to subsequent secured parties who have perfected their security interests prior to the transfer of collateral or the change in debtor's name, despite the fact there would have been all the requisite information on the register at the time of the perfection of these security interests. This goes well beyond the corresponding provisions of the Manitoba and Saskatchewan Acts and Article 9 of the Uniform, uh, U.S. Uniform Commercial Code. Generally speaking, when a trustee is required to take some action pursuant to the provisions of a trust deed or a trust indenture, he invariably relies upon statutory declarations and certificates of appropriate officers and the opinions of professional advisors. As a consequence, the risks of the trustee are kept at an acceptable level and commensurate with the fee charged for his services, which largely reflect the administrative uh, nature of the task. While the removal of, th of the three-year renewal requirement has eliminated one substantial risk, the potential liability inherent in subsection 49.2 of the PPSA may pose a real deterrent. Here, the trustee is forced to take action in circumstances where he will not likely have the benefit and direction of the usual supporting material. Despite the fact that most trust deeds and indentures contain elaborate provisions governing the transfer of secured collateral, Section 33 of the PPSA permits the debtor to transfer the encumbered property without the prior consent of the secured party. Furthermore, even a seemingly minor change, such as the substitution of INC, INC for LTD in the corporate name, will presumably trigger the requirement to file a financing change statement under 49.2. Indeed, it is difficult to ascertain with precision exactly when a trustee can be said to learn of such triggering an event. Some events will undoubtedly be widely reported in the press, others will go unnoticed for years. There is also the fact that many Canadian trust companies are national concerns with branch offices across the country. Suppose, for example, a corporate debtor in British Columbia should change its name and the local administrator of the trustee should read of the uh, change in the Vancouver newspaper, but of course does not report the event to the Toronto office. Suppose further that there is a trust indenture securing assets of the debtor located in Ontario in respect of which a financing statement has been filed under the PPSA. Arguably, according to the law of agency, the trustee has learned of the debtor's change of name and after 15 days the security interest in Ontario has become unperfected. The protection afforded to potential secured lenders by subsection 49.2 may, in fact, be all, not, be all not that necessary. Under the present CSRA regime, for example, a prospective secured party, if prudent, will investigate his debtor thoroughly, including searches to ascertain whether he has given any security under a former corporate name. Under the PPSA regime, it is submitted that this practice will not change. If the debtor should change his name or transfer the collateral, the prior secured party may not have learned of the event, and we may indeed be in the 15-day period. In each case, the prior security interest will remain perfected, and the new creditor will have to make the usual searches. Hence, 49.2, while exposing the trustee to potentially extensive liability, it does not relieve the prudent lender from the investigative responsibilities that exist under the present regime. 
One protection for the trustee in such situations might be to contract out of liability for failure to register in a timely fashion any financing change statement. However, the draft bill has introduced a prohibition against precisely that. The proposed section states, notwithstanding any agreement to the contrary, where a holder of any obligation issued or guaranteed under a trust indenture suffers any damage as a result of failure of the trustee to register diligently any financing statement or financing change statement required by the Act, the trustee is liable for the damage resulting from such failure. Such a bar to disclaimer seems entirely appropriate with respect to the registration of a financing statement in connection with the initial transaction where the trustee has the opportunity of obtaining professional advice and guidance. But given the ease with which a trustee might fail to register a change statement within the prescribed period following the learning of a triggering event, and given the significant dollar amounts typically secured by way of trustee and indenture, the exposing of a trustee to extensive damage suits without any right of disclaimer is difficult to justify. The current fee structure for trustees does not contemplate such risks, nor would it appear that such risks are insurable. In the end result, the loss may well fall on the individual holders of the underlying security instruments, notwithstanding the prohibition against disclaimer. There are also certain concerns from an administrative point of view with bringing the trustee within the purview of the PPSA as it now stands. As a result of the notice filing provisions of the Act, in order to ascertain the actual contents of a security agreement, an interested party must obtain a copy from one of the parties. Section 20 of the Act places the responsibility on the secured party to provide the debtor and other interested parties uh, with a variety of information, including, if requested, a true copy of the security agreement itself. The draft bill extends this latter requirement of providing a true copy of the security agreement to the trustee. In addition, the trustee must permit such interested parties to inspect the security agreement or a true copy at the premises of the trustee during normal business hours. Thus, in effect, the trust companies are made the registry offices with respect to corporate securities under the PPSA regime. At present, it is doubtful that trust companies have either the personnel or the equipment necessary to fulfill such an obligation. Although the draft bill makes re reference to prescribed charges to be levied for this service, Unless they are substantial, such charges are not likely to compensate the trust companies adequately for the costs involved. Unlike most security agreements currently governed under the PPSA, trust deeds and indentures, and indentures typically constitute sizable documents. In addition to a master indenture consisting of anywhere from 20 to 50 pages, there may be a host of supplemental indentures covering additional debt issues. Thus, the costs involved in reproducing documentation re representing the secured indebtedness of a major corporation can represent a considerable sum. While the provisions of Section 20 of the PPSA may be appropriate for consumer transactions, there seems to be no reason why the obligation to provide a copy of the security agreement should not rest with the debtor in the case of corporate securities. This would appear to be the situation in the United States, where under Article 9 of the U.S. Uniform Commercial Code, a secured party need only provide a simple statement of the amount of the outstanding indebtedness or a list of the collateral secured. Furthermore, such information need only be provided to the debtor. The uh, potential creditors and purchasers must deal through the debtor directly if they want to obtain such information. With the passage of last year's amendment to the PPSA permitting the registration of corporate securities, trustees may already be faced with some of these concerns. With respect to the most significant of these worries, that of exposure, exposure to large damages for failure to register diligently any financing change statement, the possibility of contracting out of liability still remains open. However, since trust deeds and indentures can still be registered under the provisions of the CSRA, the better alternative may be for the trustee to insist upon perfection under that system until the repealing legislation is enacted, hopefully with suitable protective provisions. The second issue which I'd like to examine in connection with the bringing of corporate securities into the PPSA regime is the status of the floating charge. Over the years, no device in the realm of personal property security has proved more beneficial to borrowers and lenders alike than that of the floating charge. To a borrower with assets consisting primarily of stock and trade or equipment of a nature that wears out or becomes obsolete and must be replaced from time to time on a continuous basis, such a security device is invaluable. 
To a lender, a lien that attaches to after-acquired property without the need to provide detailed descriptions in advance or to re-register the charge upon each new acquisition by the debtor is also of obvious benefit. Thus, the suggestion heard from time to time from various quarters since the enactment of the PPSA to the effect that the Act does not effectively accommodate the floating charge or at least converts it to a security interest in the nature of a fixed charge raises serious concern. The question of the exact status of the floating charge under the PPSA has not received a great deal of attention to date, largely because such charges are typically contained in corporate debentures and trust deeds which have been always registered under the CSRA. However, again, as a result of last year's amendment permitting the perfection of corporate securities under the PPSA and in light of its impending repeal and the inevitable transition provisions that will have to be constructed, the time is now ripe to examine this important issue. While the floating charge is well known to lawyers in Britain and the Commonwealth countries, it is, for all practical purposes, unheard of in the United States in the form that we know it. Since Article 9 of the U.S. Uniform Commercial Code served as the model for our PPSA, and since Article 9 does not contemplate such a device as the floating charge, the question immediately arises as to whether the PPSA is structured in such a manner so as to accommodate this uh, foreign invention. Initially, there would appear to be no problem. The Act states that it applies to every transaction without regard to its form, without regard to the person who has title to the collateral, that in substance creates a security interest. Furthermore, the draftsman of the PPSA deliberately elaborated upon the U.S. model by expressly adding the floating charge to the list of sample security interests that are set out in subclause 2A1 of the Act. The PPSA then provides a general structure for the creation and operation of innominate security interests, and our task, therefore, becomes one of examining the nature of a floating charge itself in order to determine whether there is any essential aspect of such a security interest that is fundamentally at odds with the generalized approach provided in the PPSA. You are, of course, all familiar with distinctive characteristics of a floating charge. Professor Gower has summarized them as follows. They are equitable charges on some or all the present and future property of a company subject to the company's power to deal with it in the ordinary course of business. The charge remains floating and the property liquid until some default is made and the debenture holder takes steps to enforce his security or until the winding up of commences. When that occurs, the charge crystallizes and is converted into a normal fixed charge on the assets of the company at the time of crystallization. And in Re Yorkshire Woolcomers Association, Lord Justice Romer pointed to the three typical characteristics that go up to make a floating charge. One, it is a charge on a class of assets of a company present and future. Two, that class is one which, in the ordinary course of business of the company, would be changing from time to time. And three, by the charge, it is contemplated that, until some further step is taken, the company may carry on its business in the ordinary way. Well, with respect to the first of these three characteristics, that the floating charge should constitute a charge on a class of assets present and future, it will be noted that the PPSA provides the parties with complete freedom of contract regarding the scope of the subject matter of the property to be secured, provided that the security agreement contains simply a description of the collateral. Further, the Act also expressly permits a security interest to cover after acquired property. Similarly with the second characteristic, that the assets charged typically change over the course of the normal business of the debtor. This presents no problem under the PPSA. Such changing assets may consist of equipment, chattel paper, book debts, securities, and in most cases inventory, and each of these categories of collateral is specifically provided for under the PPSA. With respect to the third characteristic of the floating charge noted by Lord Justice Romer, that the debtor may carry on business in the ordinary manner until the charge crystallizes presents more difficult considerations. At first blush, the provisions of the PPSA appear to be too narrow. Under subsection 31 of the Act, only a purchaser of goods from a seller who sells them in the ordinary course of his business takes those goods free of any security interest therein given by the seller. Hence, only third parties who are purchasers in the ordinary course sale transactions involving goods can claim the protection of this section. With respect to other types of collateral which may be subject to a floating charge, such as chattel paper and non-negotiable instruments, 
The Act looks to the purchasers and not the vendors' ordinary course of business as a criterion for third-party protection. Accordingly, it is necessary to look to other provisions of the PPSA in order to resolve this issue. In order for a security interest to attach under the PPSA, three prerequisites must be satisfied. Value must be given, the debtor must have rights in the collateral, and of key importance, the parties must intend that the security interest have attached. The question to be answered in terms of the floating charge is do the parties intended to attach upon the happening of some future event, namely crystallization, or do they intend it to attach at the outset? If it, is to, if it is concluded that it is the intention of the parties to postpone attachment until crystallization, then the security interest will necessarily be an unperfected security interest under the PPSA. Consequently, under Section 22 of the Act, the floating charge will be subordinate to a variety of third-party interests, including those with subsequent perfected security interest, those who have assumed control of the collateral through legal process, and receivers, assignees for creditors, trustees in bankruptcy, and the like. A review of the case law in this area reveals that, generally speaking, the floating charge has been accorded priority over these kind of interests. Indeed, the whole concept of crystallization is geared to defeat competing claims of such persons as trustees in bankruptcy and the like. Hence, once one might reasonably conclude, in light of the operation of the floating charge at common law, that it was the intention of the parties that attachment occur at the time of the creation of the security interest, thus allowing for perfection of the floating charge from its commencement. No doubt the most serious objection raised by those who question the viability of the floating charge under the PPSA is that upon perfection, the floating charge is converted into a fixed charge. Under the priority provisions of Section 35 of the Act, it is argued, the perfected security interest will take precedence over subsequently perfected security interests. In addition, save for limited exemptions contained for ordinary course dealings and the retention in Section 31 of the common law protection to bona fide purchasers of negotiable documents, a third party, whether dealing in the ordinary course of the debtor's business or not, will obtain, absent an express release from the secured party, assets which are subject to an encumbrance. Similarly, apart from the uh, specific exemption created for purchase money security interests, subsequent creditors who take security in the ordinary course of the debtor's business will rank junior to the floating charge. It is also worth noting that if these fears turn out not to be groundless, it will be next to impossible, I suggest, to draft suitable transition provisions in the PPSA upon the repeal of the CSRA that will not create havoc in determining priorities. Happily, however, there appears to be a satisfactory answer. Section 39 of the PPSA permits a secured party, either in the security agreement itself or otherwise, to subordinate his security interest to other interests. Obviously, express subordination would solve the problem in any given situation and may, in large dollar transactions, be resorted to out of caution. But express subordination falls well short of the flexibility currently afforded in the normal floating charge context. There is nothing in the Act, however, that would appear to prohibit a generalized subordination given in advance. Indeed, the broad scope afforded to the parties under Section 9 of the Act to enter into a security agreement that is effective according to its terms between the parties and against third parties would seem to support the proposition. It may, therefore, be argued that the mere use of the term floating charge by the parties in describing the security interest being created implicitly carries with it a generalized subordination that is, the consent of the secured party to the debtor to deal with the charge collateral in the ordinary course of his business, free of and subordinate to the lien represented by that charge. However, until our courts have actually confirmed this to be the case, the more cautious among us may wish to insert appropriate generalized subordination language into the security agreement. Returning then to Lord Justice Romer's third characteristic of the floating charge, that the debtor be able to deal with the charged assets in the ordinary course of his business, a perfected security interest in the form of a floating charge under the PPSA does appear to achieve this result. It will also be recognized that most, if not all, dispositions of collateral in the ordinary course of business will give rise to proceeds. Section 27 of the Act states that a security interest in collateral that is dealt with so as to give rise to proceeds continues as to the collateral unless the secured party expressly or implicitly authorize such dealing. Again, the mere fact that the parties have chosen a floating charge as the security interest 
arguably carries with it the implicit consent to deal with the collateral in the ordinary course of the debtor's business. And as suggested above, subsequent security interests taken in the ordinary course of the debtor's business will have the benefit and the implicit subordination uh, flowing from the selection by the secured party of the floating charge device. One matter remains to be considered. In the context of the floating charge, the only practical method of perfection of a security interest is by registration. Taking possession of the collateral clearly runs counter to the objectives underlying such a device. Yet, as the Act now stands, certain types of collateral, as already mentioned, instruments, securities, letters and advices of credit, negotiable documents of title, can only be perfected by means of possession. Whereas typically the case, a floating charge purports to cover all of the undertaking property and assets of a debtor, or purports to cover a class of, coll uh, a class of collateral of the above type uh, described, all of the concerns which we previously flagged with respect to an unperfected security interest again arise. Accordingly, it is urged that, but subject to some comments on bona fide purchasers that I want to come back to, the legislation designed to repeal the CSRA and to bring corporate securities within the ambit of the PPSA must include a provision that permits a security interest in all types of collateral to be perfected by way of registration. Lest it be thought that my interest in the PPSA is confined solely to the identification of potential problem areas, let me assure you that I am of the view that the Act represents one of the most innovative and beneficial pieces of legislation to come along in decades. The modernization and harmony now brought to the law of personal property security in this province, with the one exception relating to corporate securities already mentioned, has very much simplified the practices of the corporate financer, particularly the finance companies and the chartered banks. This result can be no better illustrated than in the field of wholesale inventory financing. The flexibility afforded under the PPSA for the taking of a wide range of security interests and the minimum of procedure required to perfect them has provided a means of literally revolutionizing the financing techniques in this area. I propose to discuss these new techniques in the context of the wholesale financing of automobiles. Prior to the passage of the PPSA, the typical procedure adopted with respect to wholesale financing of new durable goods in Ontario was for the financer to step into the shoes of the manufacturer and to assume whatever security device had been taken from the dealer. Such a practice was, and to a surprising extent still is, followed in the financing of new automobiles in the province. An arrangement is made between the manufacturer and the financer, whereby upon receipt of the dealer's order, the manufacturer presents an executed conditional sales contract together with an assignment thereof to the financer against payment for the cars. The dealer then sells the vehicles in the ordinary course of his retail business and by agreement holds the proceeds of the sale in trust for the financer. However, since such, re such retail sales are also normally made on credit, the arrangement usually extends to provide for the conditional sale of the car to the customer on the financer's standard form which contract, in turn, is assigned to the financer in repayment of the wholesale credit. The system is obviously awkward. The most significant drawback is that in order to preserve the security interest in the collateral, each individual conditional sales agreement must be registered. The manufacturer clearly has no reason to do so since it will be paid out immediately. Generally speaking, finance companies do not register the assigned wholesale conditional sales contract given the volumes and the expense involved and given the relatively short period of time the inventory is held before it is retailed. Only at the customer level, if the financer is involved in that transaction, does it take the necessary steps to perfect its security interest. Another major drawback of this system is the uncertainty surrounding the financer's claim to a lien on the proceeds of the retail sale, even where the dealer has undertaken to hold such proceeds in trust. The PPSA has largely solved these problems and has opened the way for the establishing of a simple and straightforward method of wholesale inventory financing of new durable goods. Section 13 of the Act permits for the creation of a security interest in after acquired property with certain exceptions which do not affect wholesale financing. Section 15 of the Act permits the securing of future advances by the secured party whether or not such advances are given pursuant to a commitment. The effect of these two key provisions allows the financer to enter into what we call a blanket security agreement with the dealer, whereby the terms of the entire wholesale financing to be carried on between the parties are established at the outset for an indefinite period of time. 
Such a blanket security agreement will provide for the securing of all the motor vehicles purchased from the manufacturer from time to time and for the advance of funds to the dealer to pay for such purchases. Indeed, such an agreement may further provide for additional security in all the parts or accessories or even a charge on all the undertaking property and assets of a particular dealer. The perfection of a security interest in inventory in such a blanket agreement consists of a simple single filing of a financing statement. No longer is it necessary to file in respect of individual transactions. Each time a car is acquired by a dealer, attachment occurs. And since the financing statement in connection with the collateral has already been registered, perfection will just automatically result. Furthermore, because the advances are made to enable the debtor to acquire rights in the collateral, a special type of security interest is created known as a purchase money security interest, what I shall call a PIMSI. Without going into the details of uh, what constitutes the uh, PIMSI, the other point to, to make in this area is, of course, the requirement to renew the financing statement every three years. But if the proposal contained in the draft bill for, to allow for perpetual registration is extended beyond corporate securities, then this inconvenience will also be removed for the, for the wholesale financer. The one problem in this area which is of concern has to do with the security interest in proceeds of a sale of inventory at the retail level. The PPSA states that a security interest in collateral that is dealt with so as to give rise to proceeds extends to the proceeds. And proceeds are specifically uh, contemplated in the discussion of a creation of a PIMSI, a purchase money security interest, under Section 34 of the Act. However, the key question is whether a security interest in these proceeds continues as a perfected security interest. And this brings us to perhaps the most difficult section of the PPSA as it now stands, section 27, in particular subsection 2 thereof. And there are two serious problems of interpretation presented in subsection 27.2 as is presently drafted. First, the security interest in proceeds constitutes a perfected security interest only if the security interest in the collateral is perfected. Now it may be argued that since the financer has clearly authorized the dealing in the collateral, the security interest in the collateral ceased to exist at the time the transaction arose that gave rise to the proceeds. By way of contrast, Article 9 of the U.S. Uniform Commercial Code employs the past tense, was perfected at the, uh, in its corresponding provision, to make it clear that what is required is that the security interest have been perfected at the time of the transaction. Second, even if this interpretation hurdle is overcome, it may be argued that there is a further condition that has not been met in Section uh, 27.2, that a financing statement be registered with respect to that collateral. And therefore, the secured party must either perfect his security interest in the proceeds by taking possession or filing a financing statement with respect thereof. The defect in the second uh, interpretation hurdle is similar to the first. It's the use in the clause of the present tense is registered. I understand that many practitioners have viewed this clause as referring back to the original financing statement registered in respect to the collateral. However, in a recent decision, Re Ehrman, uh, Mr. Justice Steele has interpreted the clause as to require a second filing of a financing statement with respect to the proceed, or, sorry, with respect to the original collateral in this regard. This result clearly runs contrary to the corresponding provision of Article 9 as well. In short, a system where a single registration is all that's required to perfect the security interest in inventory, but where subsequent filings are required from time to time whenever that inventory is converted into <coughs> proceeds in order to perfect a security interest in those pro proceeds, cannot have been intended by the draftsman of the PPSA. And clearly, it seems to me, an amendment to subsection 27.2 of the PPSA is very necessary. A further point I just want to mention in passing is where the dealer carries on business and lease premises. It is advisable to obtain a subordination agreement from the landlord. Under the Landlord and Tenant Act, a distinction is made between conditional sales agreements, where the landlord can, can distrain only against the tenant's interest in the goods, and the chattel mortgage situation, where the chattel mortgagee is liable to be defeated by the landlord's interest. 
Under the PPSA, of course, the distinction between the two types of security interest has disappeared. Further, the PPSA does not apply to a lien given by statute or rule of law. Case law tells us that a landlord's right of distraint, when exercised, constitutes an interest akin to a possessory lien. Hence, in any competition between a security interest under the PPSA and a landlord's distress remedy, the court will be required to determine whether the security interest at issue more closely resembles the conditional sales model or that of the chattel mortgage. And that uh, approach has now been confirmed by a recent decision of Mr. Justice Holland in Commercial Credit Corporation and Harry D. Shields Limited. Well, similar innovative techniques have been developed in the area of lease financing uh, at the retail level, and um, I will leave that uh, for the paper. But let me turn now to another very exciting area uh, for me in the 1980s, and that is the question of security interest in investment securities. The creation of a security interest in equity shares or in bonds debentures of a corporation presents some very interesting questions, particularly in light of two recent proposals. The first is that contained in the draft bill to the effect that a security interest in any type of collateral, including securities, may be perfected under the PPSA by way of registration, by way of filing a financing statement. The second is, is one which Mr. Harley will describe to you later this morning regarding the establishment of a book-based system for the recording of transfers and pledges of certificateless investment securities. Both proposals represent a radical departure from the traditional method of perfecting a security interest in negotiable collateral, namely the taking of actual possession of the physical instrument evidencing the security by the secured party. Prior to the enactment of the PPSA, the creation of a security interest in investment securities was a matter to be determined at common law. Typically, such an interest took the form of a pledge, although there is no reason why such a collateral cannot be included in the subject matter of a floating charge. The CSRA has no application since its provisions extend only to security interests created in book debts and chattels. The passage of the PPSA did little to affect the practices in this area. Following the lead of Article 9 of the U.S. Uniform Commercial Code, a security interest in securities can only be perfected by means of possession, thus essentially adopting the common law role. Further, Clause 31 of the PPSA provides that the rights of a bona fide purchaser of securities are to be determined without regard to the Act. Consequently, under the provisions of the OBCA and the CBCA, a purchaser of investment securities takes them free of any adverse claim thereon, provided he is given value, has acted in good faith, and has no notice of any adverse claim. A key question in this context is whether the term purchaser, as used in the PPSA, includes an encumbrancer such as a pledgee. There is a dearth of case law on this point. However, in both the CBCA and in the Saskatchewan personal property uh, legislation, the term is expressly given this extended meaning. Nevertheless, care should be taken before proposing a similar definition for purposes of our PPSA to ensure that it simply doesn't just remove the security interest from the ambit of that statute. And I'll return to this important question in a moment. As we have seen, it has been suggested that the PPSA be amended along the lines of the Saskatchewan Act to permit the perfection of a security interest in those categories of collateral which heretofore have been capable of perfection only by means of a secured party or his agent taking possession. The reasoning behind this proposal is to enable a receiver, when taking possession of a debtor's property under a crystallized floating charge, to assert a perfected security interest in all the assets then on hand including such items as security and money, which, perfect, which perfection will relate back to the date of the original financing statement rather than the time of taking possession. This has obvious advantages in terms of defeating competing claimants, including a trustee in bankruptcy. No such amendment was ever proposed for Article 9 in the United States, no doubt because of the absence of the floating charge device. Indeed, the official comment to the uh, relevant section of Article 9 is rather emphatic uh, in its approach. The rule is based on the thought that where the collateral consists of instruments or securities, it is universal practice for the secured party to take possession of them by way of pledge. Any surrender of possession to the debtor is for a short time. 
Therefore, it would be unwise to provide the alternative of perfection for a long period by filing, which, since it in no way corresponds with commercial practice, it would serve no useful purpose. Every day, substantial amounts of investment securities are pledged to financial institutions to secure a wide variety of commercial transactions. Purchasers of such instruments on margin pledge the collateral with their brokers, who in turn pledge the securities with lending institutions. Call loans representing millions of dollars are transacted daily on this basis. To impose upon these institutions a requirement to search registrations under the PPSA in order to determine whether or not they have an effective security interest is most unrealistic. It has been suggested that such pledges would have the benefit of Clause 31C of the PPSA and could thereby ignore any registered encumbrance upon the collateral. In the absence of an extended definition of the term purchaser, such as contained in the CBCA or the Saskatchewan Act, I doubt that such a result would obtain. Indeed, under the present PPSA structure, such an interpretation would be self-defeating. A secured party who took possession of investment securities and who thought he had all the protection afforded to such a perfected security interest would be faced with the argument that since he was a purchaser under the Act, the Act no longer applied to him. And a similar problem, of course, would apply to uh, security interest in the nature of floating charge if the amendments contained in the draft bill are passed to allow perfection by way of registration. Clearly, some amendment to the P PPSA is required to meet these concerns. The Saskatchewan Act looks like a promising model. The statute there expressly allows a uh, bona fide purchaser of security to defeat a prior registered interest in a security where he has given value, where he has required the collateral without notice, and he has taken possession of the security. Thus, pledges of investment securities in the financial community would be fully protected. A receiver under a floating charge would be able to assert a perfected security interest effective from the outset, and a problem that, uh, at least a solution such as this, which meets the problem head on rather than disclaiming jurisdiction, would seem to me to be certainly preferred. Just briefly mentioning the, the book-based system, the, the proposal to develop a certificateless uh, system of securities in this province. Uh, as I said, David Harley will be describing that to you in a few moments. Difficult questions concerning the pledging or creating of a security interest in those type of, of securities um, are obviously raised. Section 89 of the current OBCA contemplates the depository system and has a section which deems the uh, entry in the record as a taking of possession for purposes of, the P of, the of creating a security interest. The PPSA, however, does not, like Article 9 in the Uniform Commercial to Code, speak solely of mere taking of possession for purposes of creating a security interest. Indeed, it is much more specific and says that it is only good during its actual holding as collateral. And there was concern that the wording in the present OBCA will not be sufficient to accommodate Section 24 of the PPSA. And accordingly, Bill 6 contains a proposed amendment to the OBCA which states if a pledge or a creation of a security interest is intended, the making of entries has the effect of taking delivery by the pledgee or a secured party, and the pledgee or the secured party shall be deemed to have taken possession for all purposes, including purposes of the PPSA. So what we appear to have proposed in this province is a system whereby perfection of security interests of this nature will be done under the OBCA, but presumably thereafter, all questions regarding its enforcement and the rights of the secured party will be governed by the PPSA. There is a great debate on this very issue right now in the states. Um, there are clearly uh, two camps, and um, the discussion of revised Article 8 and what have you, I've dealt with in the paper, and I'll leave that to you. Basically, in the course of my remarks, I have attempted to outline some of the issues which, in my view, will not simply be merely of academic interest uh, for the decade to come, but will hold practical significance for corporate counsel as well. To be sure, the questions which I have selected for examination will not be the only issues relevant to the corporate borrower or the corporate lender in the 1980s, or perhaps even the important ones. There is certainly a need for some legislation, particularly amendments to the PPSA, to accommodate the forthcoming absorption of corporate securities into that regime. 
But as I stated at the outset, I suspect that the decade will be primarily a period of experimentation in discovering the full scope of the PPSA and in developing novel techniques for its implementation. The new approaches to wholesale inventory financing, for example, represent no more than a modest beginning in this regard. For this reason, the 1980s will be an exciting time for the practitioner involved in personal property security transactions, and rather than slavishly adhering to time-honored formulas and procedures, the lawyer is now presented with an opportunity for displaying originality and creativity in this important area. Thank you.